Uh, we will be in a passage in Romans. If you have need of a Bible, these fine gentlemen would ha- be happy to place one in your hand here this morning. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> and we know that there is great significance in the word freedom. Uh, freedom is uh, an expression that is uh, used uh, not only at this time of year here in our own country as we talk about the blessings of being free, but as well, the scripture has a lot to talk about uh, with regard to freedom as well. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans talks quite a bit about freedom, and this is the section of scripture that we're in this morning. He also in Galatians talks a lot about freedom uh, as well. And it seems like whenever the Judaizers were encroaching and there was a pull to bring the church uh, more towards a legalistic standpoint of enforcing the law that the Jews had been previously under, you find the Apostle Paul pushing back and instructing the church about the freedom that we have in Christ. There is much to say about this freedom. In many years past, I have been on this day uh, speaking uh, with regard to the state of the church and talking about what the, the, the situation we find ourselves here uh, as Americans and, and understanding how the church has, has really uh, fallen away for many uh, reasons. Uh, but this morning, what I want to do is I want to capture our minds and our hearts here as we look at Romans chapter 6 and talk specifically about the freedom that we have in Christ and understanding then the responsibility that comes with that freedom. Story is told about a, a nursery school teacher who uh, took the opportunity at this time of year to tell her class about patriotism. She said, we live in a great country. Uh, one of the things we should be happy about is that in this country, we are all free. And Trevor was a little boy in her class, came walking up to her from the back of the room, and he stood there with his hands on his hips, and he said, loudly, he said, I'm not free, he says, I'm four. Well, there are some misunderstandings when it comes to freedom, and uh, he'd get it eventually, I'm sure. But as we are here in chapter 6 of Romans this morning, it tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 15, uh, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace. May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? The Apostle Paul is dealing with a group of Christians who are very concerned that under grace, sin might abound. And it makes logical sense if you stop to think about it. Under the Old Testament law, there were certain prohibitions that were in place everywhere in society, in fact. The Pharisees, well noted, added to all these prohibitions. And so you had this this largely prohibitive uh, set of rules that the people were following. And now to come in and to remove those laws would possibly create the advance then of sin. Uh, Being over there in Asia, it's fascinating to to see what's happened there in the country in which I was teaching. Uh, The country had pushed out all religion. And in pushing out all the religion, there seemed to be a vacuum that was created. And within this vacuum, uh, certain moral standards were being compromised. And so the government has turned back to its old religions uh, that never really were an answer, but provided a framework of a, a moral framework in order to bring those things back so that the people would not uh, fill themselves with all kinds of sin because they viewed the sin that the people were committing as being detrimental to the development development of the society. Are you with me? And so here are these uh, religious teachers who have placed faith in Christ and these Judaizers as we might term them, but some of them are not Judaizers. Some of them are just plain new believers following Christ and they're very concerned about this whole doctrine of grace and where it might lead. And so they were holding on to the law and trying to keep the law. And the Apostle Paul is going to seek to straighten them out and show them that the law was not able to do anything positive in the long run 
other than to show men that they were sinners, that they were unable to keep the standard of the law. Instead, what Paul gives them is something that's very positive. He gives them something that's very encouraging. But it's a long process here in Romans as we would go through it. This morning, I want to pick the highlights out for you and focus on the, the responsibility of uh, freedom. To develop this properly, you need to know that this starts all the way back in chapter 5. And if we're looking at the context, the context really doesn't end until chapter 8. And so we could go on for quite an extensive period of time. And if you have four or five hours right now, that would be great. <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking I'd get in big trouble. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into this passage, shall we? God, we just give you thanks for the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, Lord, there it's true. There are many who are not free in this world today, but spiritually they're free in Christ I think of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are a long, long way from here who do not know the freedoms that we enjoy here in the United States. But still they worship. Still they express their Christianity in a regulated state. And so the gospel flourishes because their testimony is impeccable. Help us, Father, as believers in Christ living here in America to understand the responsibility that we have in this area of freedom. And we might truly demonstrate to the world that we live in that we are followers of Christ. And may we urge others to follow Christ as well. God bless our time together, I pray now, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, this morning, I'm not sure how much I'm going to stick to my notes. My notes are somewhat pathetic for all of the scripture here that we want to look at. But the Apostle Paul is starting this out in chapter 6 and in verse 15 where I read uh, the question then. And we have this rhetorical question similar to what we had in chapter 6 verse 1 where Paul writes, uh, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? And he, he hollers out and he says, May it never be. Or in the King James, I always like that, God forbid. He says here in verse 15, another rhetorical question, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, God forbid or may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves, and he's going to talk here about servitude, and he talks about being a slave of something. Every single one of us has to understand that we are slaves. We're not truly free. You say, really? Really? Well, this service has been all about freedom. Listen, brother, don't, don't worry about this. I'll, I'll take care of it. But, but we're, we're, we're free here in this country to an extent, but understand this, that when it comes to Christianity and following Jesus Christ, uh, there's no freedom for you. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Kevin, I came to a service about being independent and being free. And that's frankly, part of the problem that we have in the church today. Is so many people think that they're free when they're really not free. You see, Paul would say here clearly that you are either a slave to yourself or you're a slave for obedience. You're a slave, he says, of the one whom you obey. And one is going to result in death. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Or it will result in obedience. Now, for the Apostle Paul, what he's trying to do here in this greater discourse is to try to make sense of how the law has impacted his life. Notice with me in chapter 7, in verse 1, he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. That's our clue right there in chapter 7, verse 1. He's talking to Jewish people who know the law. They understand the significance of the law. And he gives the illustration of a married woman who's bound by law to her husband that is through marriage while he's living. Uh, But hooray, the man passes away, and now she's free to remarry. And he says, you know, she can be joined to another. And he makes this illustration to the point where saying, uh, you used to be uh, married to the law, but now that Christ has come, uh, you're no longer joined to the law. You're joined to Christ, you see. This is a difference that's taken place. And he, he appeals to the illustration here of marriage in the law. Therefore, my brethren, verse 4 you also were made to die to the law through the body 
of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. See, this was the point that Paul is trying to make. He says, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Now, he's going to develop that thought, but what he's saying basically is that the law uh, was such, and he gives the illustration here of uh, coveting, and he says, you know, I didn't really know what coveting was until all of a sudden I understood, here's what the law says about coveting, and now I realize I'm covetous. This is awful, he says. <laughs> and so he says, you know, all of the things in, me, in my life, he says, now are aroused because of the law. In other words, where the law says thou shalt not, all of a sudden he says, why not? You know, it's kind of like the speed limit, right? I mean, when you look at the speed limit sign, you say to yourself, 45, well, why not go 70? There's something about us that looks at that speed limit sign and says, I think it's just a suggestion. Uh, you see, the law comes, and the law says, thou shalt not do X, and it arouses within Paul's heart and mind the desire to explore that sin. And this is what he's saying about law. And so the law had a role to play in Paul's life, um, but the practicality of the law was that it made him aware of the choices that he could make. Now, understand where he goes with this. He says, now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we're bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, Paul goes on down to verse 12, and I just want to point this out. He says, so then the law, he says, is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it's righteous, and it's good. Because... What the law did for the Apostle Paul, and it did for all of those Jews, and it does to a degree for us as well, is to cause us to understand that we have never attained on our own merit to that holy standard, which is the law. Now, next Sunday, we'll talk about the holiness of God. We're going to go back to our attributes study, and we'll talk about the holiness of God. The holiness of God has to be prominent in our mindset, in other words, we need to understand fully the significance of the holiness of God. It's absolutely vital. And I really wish that I was reversing these messages, but the holiness of God just doesn't fit with the independence theme. But, but thinking about the holiness of God, and then you think about the law of God, what God is desiring to do is to show to sinful mankind, i.e. you and me, that we are incapable on our own of keeping the law. And so the question then for Paul is, is the law good or is the law evil? It's aroused my understanding of what is wrong. It's almost as though God said to Adam and Eve, you know, you're going to surely, surely die. Yes, you're going to be able to see things differently after you take this fruit. And so they did, and they had to, to cover themselves, not knowing beforehand that they were naked, not seeing anything wrong with nakedness. But all of a sudden... Things change for them. You and I, when we encounter the law, we encounter God's holy standard. And it's a standard that we are unable to meet on our own. Paul says in verse 13, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? And he says, basically, the law, which is good, is, is that the reason that I'm dying? That, is that the reason? And he says, may it never be, rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. The problem isn't, he says, with the law. The problem isn't that God gave his holy standard. The problem is with my sin, because my sin is what is keeping me from fulfilling the requirements of the holy law. That's the problem for all of us, isn't it? Uh, we come into this world, and there's none righteous, no, not one. And uh, we, we understand that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. That, that's a huge problem. In other words, the holiness of God, that, that, that standard that God has set, that requirement that's there is impossible for me to meet. I can try to do all of the good deeds possible. I can try to live a life uh, that demonstrates the highest moral character. But at the end of the day, I am still a sinner sinner. 
in need of having that sin removed. So Paul is looking at the law and he says, this whole law thing and trying to keep the law is a major struggle for me. Notice here in verse uh, 14, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Now again, the idea of bondage to sin, Paul is saying, I'm a sinner and, and I'm, I'm linked to this. I'm a prisoner of my sin. So when I look at the law, I look at the law and it's a very positive thing. I, I look at the Ten Commandments and he says, that sounds great. But he says, I have a problem. He says, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I'm not practicing, that would I like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. And so there is Paul's enigma. Paul is having this, this constant pull. He sees the law as something that's good. And when he breaks the law, he confesses that the law is righteous, that the law is holy, that God is just in, in giving us the law. But he finds himself unable to meet the requirements of this law. He keeps failing over and over and over again. He keeps failing. And the reason why he keeps failing is because he's still in bondage to his sin. Do you see that? He's still linked to that sin. He's not free at all. In, in fact, he is a, a slave to this sin, and it is causing him such great consternation. He says, so now, he says, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So he says, I, I want to do what's right, but the actual doing of the good is not happening. For he says, the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Over in Romans chapter 10 and verse 2, it says, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. The Jewish people had a tremendous zeal for God. And maybe you are a very religious person. Uh, you, you may be deeply religious. I, I've met some people who were extremely, extremely religious. But depending upon their good works, frustrated them daily. They were never able to say that I'm free in Christ. Uh, there's a legal standard that I'm trying to adhere to. Uh, it's the Ten Commandments. It's what the, uh, the Sunday school teacher taught me, or it's what uh, the Old Testament teaches, and I'm trying to hold on to this, but I'm very, very frustrated. Paul, who is a well-trained theologian, who is of the highest degree, looks at trying to keep the law, and even though he is tremendously zealous, even to the point where he is persecuting the church for their faith in Christ, Paul is frustrated because in the flesh he knows he cannot please God. And he keeps falling short of this standard that God has raised. And so it is a frustration to the Apostle Paul on and on and on again. And so Paul realizes that the law was not able to accomplish by following the law, it wasn't able to accomplish the end result that he was after. Now, Paul is going to go on, and here's that famous verse. He says, for I joyfully, in verse 22, we'll go into the famous verse in 24, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul says, on the one hand, I find myself with a mind that wants to serve the law of God, but the other with the flesh of the law of sin. 
Now, there's a lot of debate within theological circles as to whether or not this passage of Scripture that I just read, these couple of verses here, O wretched man that I am, referred to the Apostle Paul before he was a Christian, before he was following Christ, or is this his daily struggle as a follower of Jesus Christ? And I can cite for you uh, theologians par excellence who differ on this point. In fact, when I taught uh, the book of Romans in in, in Africa several years ago, uh, we took a commentary by Robert Mounts, uh, who says, no, absolutely, Paul is without question uh, a believer, and this is his struggle that he's facing uh, day by day, and here's the evidence. And then you have Dr. Douglas Moo, who's pretty much the authority of authorities. Uh, Mounts' commentary is an inch thick, and Moo's is three inches thick. And uh, Moo says, no, he paints this whole picture, and he says, no, this is all a reference to Paul pre-conversion. And this was the point in time where he, he just says, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, who can deliver me from this, this conflict? I'm under the weight of sin. And he says, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, I am now made free, you see. And he says, this is, this is wonderful. And you can study it for yourself and decide, I won't tell you which is which. Because how am I supposed to know if those guys don't know? <laughs> I, I've taught this many, uh, many times, and uh, most of the time I would say that when Paul cries out, wretched man that I am, uh, he's referencing here a, a daily struggle as a believer. And I'm not so sure that this passage actually isn't relating to both times in his life where he is looking at it and saying, no, the law really didn't accomplish uh, the desired result. Uh, at, at the end of the day, however, I'm finding myself uh, dealing with another law, a different law in my members uh, that are waging war against the law of my mind. In other words, his mind wants to follow the Lord. He wants to be obedient to the Lord. And yet he finds himself in that struggle. Notice uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. This is a famous verse as well, well known. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so being in Christ Jesus provides us with the relief from the law, the law being such an enormous burden for us. And he goes on and he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Right? I mean, amen. That's just, that's just phenomenal. That is just absolutely the best news. Now let's go back to our passage that we're really focusing on here this morning, which is there in, in Romans chapter 6. Because here in Romans chapter 6, uh, Paul is going to make the case of, of freedom uh, in Christ. And he's going to, to point out the reality is that we are really uh, a servant of one or the other here. And he makes this point, he makes it, it very clear. Uh, along the lines of freedom, there's always responsibility. Uh, Robert Mount says, freedom is not the exercise of unlimited spontaneity. Uh, it means to be set free from the bondage of sin in order to live in a way that reflects the nature and the character of God. I believe as believers, the church today has an enormous amount of responsibility. Uh, that we have, to whom much is given, much is required, a responsibility to live out our faith in such a way that is impactful to the world. I really believe that. Uh, especially in light of the fact that there are other nations that do not have freedom uh, to worship out in the public square, and yet their Christianity is absolutely thriving, whereas we as Christians here in America are not taking seriously the responsibility that we have uh, to deal with the freedom that God has blessed us with. Uh, the United States in the past has done wonderful things uh, involving uh, evangelicalism over the years. There's been some tremendous progress. Uh, there's been great ideas. There's been a lot of action on these ideas, and these things are wonderful. But there is a responsibility that we have as Christians to make choices that are impactful uh, for the world. Uh, Paul is going to tell us uh, that without a doubt there is um, there's a master in our life. He says there's no absolute independence for man. Our nature requires us to serve some master. 
this is always going to produce in our lives a, a struggle. It's going to produce a, a difficulty at times. You can have peace or you can have freedom. Don't ever count on having both at once. I thought that was an interesting quote. Oftentimes there is that struggle and peace is going to come with a price. Freedom is always very, very significant. I had to crack up. I was looking online at, at different um, quotes that people made. And uh, I came across a couple people. I, I threw them up here. I hope you're not offended. But this is uh, Sigmund Freud. I think he's a knucklehead, but whatever. Most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility and most people are frightened by responsibility. That was a perfect quote. I, you know, I'd like to change the name, but you know, you can't really do that. And then this one, this is great. This is Bob Dylan. You know, I should read it like that. He says, I think of a hero as someone who understands the degree of responsibility that comes with his freedom. I thought, wow, that's a really good quote as well. Uh, but looking at the scripture, that's exactly, the Bible is talking about here, it's talking about responsibility. Notice with me here in this passage, as we go back here to our passage in Romans chapter 6, and the Bible says, as Paul is going to point out, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? And there's going to be a result that is going to take place. So let me give you a couple of facts. First fact is you're not really free, but we are slaves, verses 16 and 17. Verse 17 says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Paul is describing here the transformation that takes place when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And he's appealing here to these uh, people who would like to go back and, and pull from the law because they're concerned with the moral standards failing. And what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to teach very clearly that there's been a transformation and we're no longer slaves to the law. He says, thanks be to God that you were, in the past, slaves of sin. Now, to be a slave of sin meant that you tried to keep the law on your own, but fell short of that goal. And because you fell short of that goal, you began to serve sin. And he says, as a servant of sin, you changed. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. I like verse 18, and having been freed from sin. He is saying there was a point in time where you were freed from sin, and that freedom from sin continues on in the future. The results of that decision are continuing to be ongoing. And so here we have these choices that are so significant and he's telling us here that we need to make the choice that is the right choice. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. So there's the choice that we have. You and I have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you've made that choice. Your heart has been changed. Paul will go on into Romans chapter 12. He'll talk about the significance of being a servant to Christ because our hearts have been changed. If our heart's been changed, we're no longer to be obedient to the flesh and lawlessness. Instead, he says, present your members or present your body as unto that which is righteous. You have a decision to make. Now, as we went through chapter 7 in Romans, Paul is talking about this constant struggle that he has. And he had this struggle to try to be righteous, but he was under the impression that he had to keep the law. That all was true until Jesus Christ came on the scene. And Jesus Christ came on the scene, and it literally changed everything. Now, you and I, for the most part, our backgrounds are not similar to those 
who the audience here in Romans uh, are indicating. They, these people are, are primarily, they, they, they understand the Jewish law, they understood what was required, they understood they couldn't do those things, and so there's something, though, that they're holding on to. It's very difficult for many people who are saved out of religious backgrounds to release that religion that they were adhering to. All the teaching from the time that they were children, I mean, all of those things that are embedded in their minds, very difficult to let it go and to say, okay, I'm going to follow Christ exclusively. But that's what Paul is teaching here. You used to be, he says, following after that which was a dead end and led to that which wasn't good. Now, he says, you make a decision. Paul is talking about, in chapter 7, the capability that we have in Christ. That the potential now is to live a life that brings about righteousness and godliness, and as he says there in chapter 7, bears fruit. This is the potential that we have. So the wonder of it all is the fact that we are today free in Christ. Isn't that a blessing? Uh, to be free in Christ is works thing. hey, hallelujah. I, I have been released from the chains of my sin. Uh, before this, I had no other outcome. My life was heading down a pathway. And yes, a person could place faith in God and be saved in the Old Testament and saved during the time of Jesus Christ. But now we have with Jesus uh, an entirely different way to live. And God presents it to us as followers of Christ and tells us we have a choice to make. We have a choice. So the first fact is we're not really free, but we're still slaves, but we're slaves to righteousness. Verse 18, we've been freed from sin, but you've become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking, Paul says, in those human terms. Notice in verse 20, he says this. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you didn't pursue righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you're not as now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. Wow. Y you see, how we live life is absolutely significant, isn't it? The choices that we make. Prior to a person's faith in Christ Jesus, they are living under a standard that will not produce life, but produces death. Now, I hate to break it to you this morning, but I want to break it to you this morning. If you're here today, and, and you're not sure about where you're going to spend eternity because you've been trying to do your best, and you're, you're piling up the good works in your own mind, can I just tell you that at the end of the day, when your life is over, those good works will not save you, but they will only frustrate you, and you will spend eternity in hell if those good works are apart from Jesus Christ. And that is a horrible, horrible reality for millions upon millions of people who live here in the United States, who we interact with all the time. Some people will say, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. I, I talked to a fellow this week. He said, no, he says, I'm, I'm going straight to hell. Whoop, straight down. That's where all my buddies are. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you even know what it's like there? Have you ever read the Bible and understand what the Bible says about that? That's horrible. But understand that all of these different pathways and all of these different religions without Jesus Christ all lead to the very same place. They all lead to hell. They all lead to the reality of death. And that's why Paul says what he says there in verse 23, a verse we, we memorized in Awana. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I think I quoted King James and wrote it in New American Standard. But it's kind of like Mandarin and Cantonese, you know, or something. I don't know. There is, and this is the second fact, that the best reason for choosing Christ is the final outcome. If you stay on this pattern of life, and you're a slave to sin, the outcome is death. 
if you choose Christ, you're choosing life. He says, but now having been freed from sin, verse 22, and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Paul talks here about the significance of sanctification. Being made holy like God is holy. You and I have to understand that God is a holy God. And there is absolutely no way for you and I to meet the requirements of God's holiness and live with him forever. It is only possible through Jesus Christ where my sins are forgiven. The reality of my sin is not up for debate. Is the reality of your sin up for debate? Are you going to argue with me that you're not a sinner? Are you going to argue with, with your friends that, that you really have enough righteousness to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Are you really going to make that point? Or are you going to say, you know, you're right. For me, there's no point in trying to argue that I am righteous and on my own I deserve a place in the heavenly kingdom. The reality is I do not. The reality is that life lived the way it was being lived would result in death. But in choosing Christ, I'm now free from the bonds of sin. And I'm happy to say I am enslaved to God. Now following that out, he says that the benefits for us, twofold, one is sanctification. You and I become more like Jesus Christ. And ultimately, when I get to heaven, there is nothing good that I have done to warrant my being there other than my faith in Christ, which has saved me. And I am now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And it is so vital that we understand that. In fact, this, this passage, I'm, I'm, doing terribly, uh, I'm doing a terrible job at representing the entirety here. You would need to go back to chapter 6 and a passage that we dealt with uh, when we read uh, prior to a baptism, for instance. That passage, I am in Christ. That's why I can spend an eternity with a uh, holy God. I am in Christ. I am ensconced in the righteousness of Christ. And my sins are as removed as the east is from the west. But understand that I am free from the bonds of sin. But I'm not free and I don't want to be free. I want to be enslaved to God. I want to be his child. It results in two things. Sanctification in that same passage eternal life eternal life now there is death and there is life and then there is death and there is eternal life amen do you notice that it's a subtle little difference but we're comparing death to life but we're not just comparing death to life we're comparing death to eternal life that is what i have in jesus christ that's what you have in jesus christ and so that's why the admonition here in this passage is to humble ourselves before God and be truly his slave. I am his servant to obey. And so my freedom is truly in Christ. And I submit that freedom to God and I follow him. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Christ, Will you break those chains of sin? Will you allow God to save you from your sin and the consequence of your sin, which as we note in verse 23 is death, separation from God? Will you place your faith in Christ? And then if you truly are a follower of Christ, will you take the responsibility that you have now to present your body to God for righteousness? Will we take it seriously, the fact that we have been saved, that we are fully pardoned, that we'll spend our eternity in heaven? Will we take that seriously? Will this responsibility truly uh, be a governing factor in our life? That is a sobering question to ask. As I mentioned last week, we don't like the idea of being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. 
Ephesians 4 talks about that. We don't like that concept. We may not like the concept that we are enslaved to God, but that is exactly the role that we have now as followers of Christ. And aren't you happy to be enslaved to God when you realize that the alternative is to be enslaved to sin and the result of that is death? How will you use your freedom? Isn't that a great question? How will you use that freedom? You know how those movies work out? You know, the guy comes out of prison, you know, and he's standing there and all he's got is his saddle. And, you know, I mean, he's, you know, it's like, well, how are you going to use your life now? What are you going to do? What will you do as a follower of Christ who is truly free? Free but enslaved to God. Let's pray, shall we? You may be here this morning and God has spoken to your heart about where you'll spend your eternity. That is an extremely sobering question. Eternity is beyond our understanding in scope of time. Uh, We measure time in seconds, we measure time in minutes, in hours, days and weeks, months and years, and that's pretty much it. If we really want to get out there, we'll talk about decades and rarely ever talk about centuries. But the Bible talks about eternity in one place or another. You're here this morning and God has spoken to your heart. We're going to have a word of prayer in a moment, but maybe you'd be here and say, Pastor Kevin, please pray for me. I want to be certain that I'm on my way to heaven and I have some questions in my mind. Uh, That's a place where, frankly, we have all found ourselves at that place. And fortunately, Christ has been the answer. And we have thanks to God through what Christ has done. But maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, would you pray for me? I have some questions that are rattling around in my head about where I'm going to spend my eternity. If God's working in your heart and life this morning, I just encourage you today to make that decision to trust Christ for salvation. Put your faith and trust in him. The Bible tells us that we're sinners and we need that forgiveness that only Christ can provide. In a moment, we're gonna just stand and and have a word of prayer, but if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Kevin, God's speaking to my heart today about this issue of eternity. Can I pray for you? Is there anyone who slip up your hand this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me? God's working in my heart today. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. I say those words, Lord, and I realize we can't thank you enough for what Jesus Christ has done for us. How difficult and how frustrating it must have been for the Apostle Paul to view his life in light of a holy standard, the law, and realize that even though he tried to keep it, even though it was the desire of his heart to do so, Lord, he failed over and over again. And then he came to realize the problem wasn't with the law, the problem was with his sin. And so it is today, Father, that we're dealing with our sin. But we thank you, Father, that we have Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, now today there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. For we have truly been set free from the bonds of our sin. Help us, Lord, in the decisions that we face day by day to make the right choices. For truly, Lord, we're under the weight of what Paul described as understanding that in his body there was and is, and ours as well, the reality of a sin nature. Help us, Father, to make the right choices. Help us, Father, amidst the freedom that Christ has given us 
to truly desire to be enslaved to God. Place this in our heart, Lord, that we might be honoring to you in all things. Father, I thank you for being here with us today and blessing us with your word. May we be encouraged because of the freedom that we have, not only here in America, but in Christ. May you be truly glorified by our lives, Lord, I pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you come back for the, uh, the picnic that we're gonna have, and I understand, do you have another song? Okay, <laughs> they're gonna have another song, but let me just say, I hope you come back for the picnic in an hour or two. Thank you.